in conversation with Barry Wimbold. Barry, welcome in this podcast. Thank you so much. It's a privilege. Uh, and people always say that, but it, it really does feel very nice to be speaking to somebody about a subject I love. And good to hear. I got to know you through a course on Udemy on uh, solution focused uh, brief therapy. And uh, yep. it's, I, I guess it's your specialization, right? Yes. Yes, it is. And I wrote a book uh, in 2011, I think, or 2020, 10, 2011, that was published. And I was talking to my wife about that this morning, actually, because um, I wondered if it was still in print, because I haven't received any royalties lately. Oh, um, <laughs> but I get practically every week, I get notification of somebody citing it in in an academic paper, which is very gratifying. I can imagine. Yeah, what's it called? So it's called um, it's called solution focused therapy in in the helping professions. I should now, order one. <laughs> uh, well, I'd be uh, very happy to send you one. I mean, the the thing about it is that I taught solution focused therapy for by the time I'd written this book, probably fifteen years. Wow! And my main market at that time was that most of my work was in the public sector in the UK, mm -hmm. and a little bit in Switzerland and one or two other places. And I was teaching therefore solution focused therapy to people who were not counsellors for the most part, I was teaching the ideas, teaching sounds like a big word, but I was conveying the ideas and shaping the the concept. Uh, to people who used counselling skills, but didn't see themselves as counsellors, uh -huh. sometimes coaches, more often teachers, social workers, ministers in the church, wow. people working in charities. That's nice. What I've what I've in, what I've styled the helping professions. In other words, people who help others. Yeah. So I developed a way of without knowing it, I developed a way of speaking about this subject without speaking about therapy too much. Oh, you made it very accessible, right? That was the aim because mm. I didn't want to scare people off. Mm, and okay. also at that time, I was finding people saying in the early days, well, we're not therapists, you know, why would you we use this? So I had to make the case yeah. for that. And we did quite a lot of role play. And once they'd experienced it, mm. a, a way of having a conversation, even in the very early part of a workshop, uh, they got it. You know, I had a way of, of, of conveying that. It sounds very interesting. Now I get curious. What's your special way? I think of I, I think I stole it. it. I think I stole it from probably De Chesa, mm -hmm. but it may have been Bill O'Hanlon because Bill O'Hanlon was a big influence when I started out. Wasn't he um, originally the gardener of Milton Erickson? Yeah, of Milton Erickson. Another influence yeah. on me, Milton Erickson, because I was trained as an Ericksonian hypnotherapist in the in the early days. Oh, wow. uh, that was kind of my second round of training. And mm -hmm. that was about 30 years ago. Go so I, um, I had this idea that I would say to people, well, I'd like you to I'd give them I can't remember exactly, but we always we had a flip chart. So I'd say, well, um, get into 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 dyads into twos pairs and one of you has got a problem you know and I don't want deep and meaningful stuff we don't want any tears or flashbacks or <laughs> anything um, undesirable in the workshop that was always a bit like my light-hearted way of introducing it but I would say you know think of something that's been bugging you it may be a neighbor that's a bit of a nuisance it may be one of your kids it's just something that's a nuisance in your life that you'd like to change and tell the other person the, per the person in the role of therapist what it is and the person in the role of therapist simply pursues their normal line of questioning finding out everything they can about the problem mm. and i get them to do that for two minutes that was mm. it and then i get them to scale it so uh, separately, I would ask the person with the problem, how optimistic on a scale of one to 10 do you think that do you feel about this, you having some movement with this problem here today? Mm. Yeah, two, three, one, that there sort of thing. Yeah. And then I'd say, okay, and then I'd, I'd also get the um, 
the other the, the the therapist to mentally scale it without sharing it in fact i got them both to scale it without sharing it but mm -hmm. to make a note and then i'd say okay i want you to do it again but i would instruct the therapists and originally i'd take them out of the room but i found that wasn't necessary uh, to and i'd say now i want you to have a conversation you are only allowed to look for exceptions and things that are going right and any possible beneficial side effects of this mm -hmm. in other words i completely twisted it into a more solution focused uh optic but but conversationally i tried not to use exceptions i didn't use solution focused language at that point mm -hmm. and amazingly you know the the average was two to three points up on the scale Wow. that people would report at the end of what a five minute exercise altogether. And that was kind of like my icebreaker. Incredible. Yeah, I love it. And, and one or two people, of course, would say I didn't notice any difference, but they would reveal in their language that they did. So mm -hmm. I would be able to say, well, then how come you said, whatever, you know, and so there would be a little, and I never sought to have approval for that exercise, it was simply to start a process. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty confident that, that the what I would call the naysayers or the people with a slightly more resistant or negative turn of phrase, turn of mind would by the end of the day, kind of be on board with it. Yeah, I can really imagine. I love I love this way of experiencing what doesn't work and what does work in a completely with, different way. Yeah, without telling them what I was doing or why I was doing it. I oh, just wow. wanted them to experience it. Yeah, so strange. and um, and really that I think that teaches another thing too. I have to say I'm not comfortable with the word teach, but I'm using it anyway. Um, I think it conveys another idea, which is something strange is going to happen in this room today. Mm. You know, open your minds. It's not mm. going to be like anything else you've experienced before. You say that in advance? Yes, yes, yeah. I do. Nice. I say okay. one of my opening lines is yeah. um, we have one thing in common. We've never met. We have no one thing in common. None of us knows what's going to happen today. You know, nice. and so that would bring people together. You know, it's common ground. Yeah, it's uncertainty. We don't know what's mm -hmm. going to happen. But of course, the expectation is in I hope in my demeanor that it's going to be something positive, of course, <laughs> you know, yeah, not, yeah. not something scary or frightening. Mm -hmm. um, although in the early days, and particularly when I was teaching counselors, I can remember I'm talking now about maybe the late 90s. Uh, I was in two situations where I had a lot of pushback because they one was a university and one was a GP medical medical practice. And in both cases, there were about 12, 15 counsellors in the room. And uh, just to summarise it, um, one group was quite hard with me, the GP medical, medical practice people, mm -hmm. um, because they didn't like the idea of working on a reduced time frame or and I've never said you have to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always said, look, it, it tends to be briefer because of the way you work. Nobody's mm -hmm. imposing brief therapy on you. Yeah. Um, so, in fact, my book is called Solution Focused Therapy, not Solution Focused Brief Therapy, because mm -hmm. my therapy uh, can last sometimes years. I mean, people come back at their own pace, but, mm -hmm. you know, I've had somebody come back after seven years, somebody else after 10 years. It wasn't mm -hmm. continuous. Mm -hmm. but I didn't want to feel, people to feel restricted. So mm -hmm. the first year they gave me a bit of a rough ride, and I think there were probably three out of 15 who really got it and enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. The second year I went back to the same group, and I said, oh, we were here last year. You know, is anybody, you know, a few hands went up of people who'd been there last year. And the biggest, most empowering piece of feedback I had was when I came along, when you came along last year, I hated you. That was actually the word to you as a counsellor. Wow. I hated you and I hated the ideas. But as you said, go away and try some of this stuff, because I've never sold it as a model. It's not a model. I've sold mm -hmm. it as an approach and a bunch of stuff you can do. Mm -hmm. And she said, and I've always said to people, start with one thing, mm -hmm. try and try reframing try scaling you know you don't have to do the whole lot mm. and build up from there and she went away and tried something and she said i just saw the difference and i'm mm. a psychodynamic therapist and i've introduced these ideas i even used the miracle question mm. so you know my idea was never to force feed people it was mm. always to go softly softly as we would with our clients yeah, great, great uh, story. And uh, I can imagine that she has to uh, get a little bit uh, acquainted with uh, this method because the medical model is almost 
diametrical to the solution focused way of thinking, yeah. right? Yeah. But also yeah. the psychodynamic model versus solution focused is also a bit uh, different. Yes. So she had to make yeah. a big leap. Hmm. And if I'm, if I can look back on it now, and I started my training in France when I first became interested in all of this. I was living in oh, France. Right. And I had a friend who was uh, about the age I am now. Mm -hmm. And um, he uh, was a psychodynamic practitioner and trainer. Mm -hmm. He worked in the business field. He wasn't, he wasn't, a, he was a Freudian enthusiast shall I call it he wasn't working as a therapist but he he took me to some workshops and he I went into psychodynamic counseling I went I actually went to see a Freudian therapist and I found it horrible mm. and quite abusive mm. and a lot of stuff was going on in my life at that time I'd had mm. a serious road accident I'd fallen off my motorbike mm. my mother mother died mm. and I was made redundant all in the same very well I, I was in hospital and I came out of hospital convalescing then I was made redundant and the same weekend my mother died so I flew back to England very quickly and um so I wasn't in a very good place just after that and my health was suffering because of my accident I became quite ill hmm. and um almost in desperation I went to see somebody in Strasbourg and they were very helpful but I was only there two weeks and then I went back to where I was living in France and uh teamed up with this this uh Freudian therapist and I just found it my god it was it was a it was a, it was in no way empathetic or or sympathetic to me or my yeah. I felt felt very um uncomfortable with it mm. and Furthermore, he wouldn't let me stop going. I lived opposite him. I could look into his office from my flat, which was above. And I, I just I told him when we, I said, look, this doesn't suit me. I'm not, I'm not going to continue. And he didn't say anything. It was a, the blank screen, you know, the, mm -hmm, you know. And so I left and the next week I didn't go. And five minutes after my appointment time, my phone rang. He said, where are you? I said, I told you I'm not coming. He said, you don't do that. Wow. That is not the process. And, and I went back, I went back to see him. And then uh, after that, I was going to travel abroad, I was going to be traveling in Russia with my work and everything. And I said, uh, Look, I can't do it. Uh, because I'm now based in Paris, and I'll be traveling. And he said, and every excuse, I can't afford it. I'm traveling, you know, he had an answer. And in the end, I said, Look, I don't know what I need to say to get you to get this idea that this relationship is ending now. And and I left. But, you know, I was in fairly a fairly intimidated position. I was much younger then. Yeah, I didn't yeah. really under I guess I was um, probably in my early 40s. But this was all new to me. And, um, and, uh, let me check. Di you didn't know the solution focused approach yet? Oh, or? no, 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 no. That was okay. later. No, no, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, because so, of things I was doing, I wound up in a place where I could train in the different modalities. Yeah. So you really had a strong negative experience that, I mean, did yeah. it influence you to look in other directions? I didn't think that I consciously did that. I mm. trained in stress management. Then I went into Ericksonian hypnotherapy and then family therapy. And then at that time, we found a colleague and I founded an institute. Mm -hmm. Uh, called the European Therapy Studies Institute. And we started publishing a journal in the UK called The Therapist. Mm -hmm. And I worked for probably six, seven years on that. And we, we did a lot of training in that time. And that's when my introduction to solution focused therapy started. Mm -hmm. I, I came across that. And I it just suddenly made sense to me. And I, I've subsequently decided that you know, there's come, I'm an optimist, and there's something in me that always wants to look forward and, and go forward. And if I had a problem, I'd, I'd tackle it first, you know, all except my taxes, I tend to leave those too late, but everything else, I'll, my philosophy has been, just go towards a problem, and sort it out, then you can then you can sleep at night, you know, that was my natural inclination. So when I went to hear Bill O'Hanlon speak, I can't remember how aware of it I was by then of solution focused as a model. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I know you know about Frank Farrelly. I'd already trained with Frank Farrelly then and um, probably Dr. Michael Yapko on depression and a number of other people. I was very lucky to have access to lots of things because of my role with the journal that we were publishing. Mm. And um, so, so a, a lot of listeners uh, of, of, of this podcast, I think they already know a little bit about Solution Focus, but some maybe don't. And since you are that experienced with making it very accessible, could you summarize in a few sentences what what is it? What what's what's what's? Uh, I I yeah. my my kind of thumbnail sketch of solution focus and related approaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bill O'Hanlon spoke about three waves of psychotherapy in a, in an article okay. he wrote in the Family Networker about I don't know thirty years ago, twenty five years ago. But I split it into two, basically, mm -hmm. for simple, uh, for a simpler explanation. And that is that until a certain point in time and, you know, 50s, the 60s, whatever, there was a basically th therapy was basically built around Freud and colleagues mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. You talked about a problem, but it worked very much on a traditional analytic kind of idea. If you can find the, the, the source of the problem, you'll find a solution. You know, you, you'll you have insight and you'll free yourself in some way. I mean, mm. I'm not doing it justice, but that's mm. something like that. Mm. And then along came the strategic therapist. Milton Erickson, of course, was a, 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 a vanguard of that. Uh, was a, really not by self-appointment, but that's people were looking to those ideas and Virginia Satir and a very much more strategically operating so a client comes in there's a problem okay how can we make your life a bit easier today mm. what do we need to do so it's very mm. much more hands-on and mm. forward-looking mm. so basically we've got a kind of an archaeological model which looks to the past but, but very importantly it asks the it suggests that if you find a solution if you find that the source of the problem mm. and what do people so often say oh, if i just knew why this was mm. happening to me mm. uh, and more of that later but um versus a more up-to-date model as i saw it which was better and has proved to be much much better for our short-term world and you know quick mm. results and is what's known as broadly strategic therapy or mm. solution focused mm. the solution focused family of therapies including cbt and so mm. forth and a number of others and i think to some extent a lot of the traditional uh the, the, the up and coming REBT, for example, rational emotive behavior mm. therapy and uh, and allied kind of approaches, even to some extent person centered, they've started to look forward much more. But mm. at the time it was there was a split. Mm -hmm. You went to a counselor and most likely you'd be musing on your upbringing, your past, your parents, your experiences. And then along comes well, De Chaser and all that lot. Uh, and they're saying, you don't have to do this. And interestingly, De Chaser was very hooked into philosophy. And um, that was very useful too, and is very useful in, in informing the approach. So uh, solution focused therapy, somebody walks into the room for, for those who aren't familiar with it. And I will ask them what, what brings us together. I don't want to know about the problem. They will mention it soon enough. I don't have to ask. Mm -hmm. And then very quickly, I'll be looking for why are you here? What, what's going to make today, single session, what's going to make today better, for, going to make today um, a good use of your time is the way I usually express it. Mm -hmm. And I work on a single session model. So I may never see the, the, the client again. And in fact, for some years, I did advertise myself as a single session therapist. Mm -hmm. Um, and I trained quite, quite a lot of people in that and got quite a lot of resistance to the idea too. But that mm -hmm. came from experience mm -hmm. and also research by Moisha Talman. Um, can't remember the title of his book now, but, um, you know, that suggested that a lot of good stuff happens in the first therapy and mm -hmm. others. That's not the only source of that information. That's an interesting uh, paradox. Huh? And uh, uh, Earlier you said sometimes it may last for years. And, and on the other hand, you you name it single session therapy, which I Absolutely. understand. But yeah. what can you explain this paradox? I'll explain it with a Bill O'Hanlon story. All right, please. Uh, Bill O'Hanlon, um, 
two things he he said in the first time I saw him. I, I I will have seen him after that, but the the first one stuck in my mind, and it was a workshop run by Brief in London, mm -hmm. who were really they were the early adopters, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and a guy called Ron Wilgosh. They were the people I knew about who were ahead of everybody else with this, mm -hmm. and of course they're still there and doing very well. I think you mean Chris Iveson and uh, yes, Chris and uh, Evan George mm -hmm. and uh, who's the third person that escapes mm -hmm. me? I apologise now publicly if I've forgotten your name. Um, and Bill O'Hanlon said um, he had a client who came in to see him, was waiting in the waiting room, and um, the, some of his flyers were lying about for a workshop or something. And the client came in waving this flyer, saying what's all this about brief therapy? I've been seeing you for two years. And Bill said, Yeah, we've been doing brief therapy for two years. You know, that's and that, that's my response. And what I usually say in the workshops, look, let's get some ideas straight here. It's not about solutions, because think people think it's about looking for solutions. Mm -hmm. It's not about solutions. Mm -hmm. Take the whole phrase, it's solution hyphen focused. You know, so in other words, we're focused. It's, it's about where we're looking. It's about the orientation mm -hmm. that we take in our conversations. And the second thing is that it's uh, it tends to be therapeutic, but it's not imposing anything on people. The conversations help people and blah, blah, blah. And this idea about brief is a result of speaking that way. It's not a driving force in the approach. Mm -hmm. So it happens to be brief because clients are having empowering, uh, life changing conversations because of the way the therapists conduct the conversation. Mm -hmm. And because of the way the therapist asks questions and because of the focus taken by the therapist in that conversation. So mm -hmm. if a client comes into me and they're depressed and they've been depressed for 10 years and I join them in that discussion, about depression, as Michael Yupko says, pretty soon they will put me in their trance, mm. and the whole session will be lost. Yeah. Whereas when they come in, I want them to be surprised right away that mm -hmm. I ask some very strange questions. It's one of my, I suppose, specialisms. I've, I've asked questions that I didn't know what they were till I heard them come out of my mouth. Do you have some examples for people who don't? Well, um, I've got a I've got a negative example first, which is I had a very elderly elderly. He's probably the age I am now. He's an elderly Irish musician, and he rang rang up and said, you know, could he have an appointment? But before that happened, I went through the usual sort of light sales pitch about what I did, and and he told me his story, and and, and we I couldn't get off the phone. He was clearly very unhappy and in a in a pretty difficult place. So when he arrived the next day, I said, I opened the door and I said, how are you? And he told me. And that took hours. <laughs> and, and I was quite new at that time and I didn't have the, the means of kind of. So I went away and I set myself a task, five greetings that don't ask how you are. Mm -hmm. You know, so, oh, nice tie. Uh, thank you for being promptly hip. Thank you for being on good time, you know, on time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think my favorite is things like um, what brings us together mm -hmm. and why now? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and what are you hoping for in this conversation? Those are probably mm -hmm. something like that will be mm -hmm. my first three conversations, first mm -hmm. three openers. Uh, the problem with me is that I'm, a, as you probably gathered, I'm a bit of a talker and I love these conversations and I have to really discipline myself to stay on track. Oh, yeah. um, one of the things that I was reflecting on. Can before I, can I recap for a moment? Sure. So yeah, um, we were talking about the paradox and the way I understand it is that every session can be the last one. Also the first one. Can yes. Be the last one. Yes. Uh, but sometimes, you know, sometimes people need three sessions and they stay away for a year and they, they come back. Yeah, another session, something yeah. like that, huh? Yeah. And what I like a lot, it's it's such a sharp contrast with what happened to you before with the Freudian therapist, yeah. who said yeah. you can't leave. Yeah. Although you have to travel, I don't care. We don't do it like this. And it's such a different, more client-centered and and just being of service kind of attitude, which I love. Is is that the way you see it? Mm. 
Yes, it is. Mm. I think. Um, sorry, I went off piece a bit. I went off it's the okay. track a bit, didn't I? But um, thank you for bringing me back so adroitly. That's um, keep me on on track. Um, first of all, I don't think what I my first experience with the psychodynamic person was therapy. Mm. I think it was something else entirely. I wouldn't call it therapy because it mm. wasn't therapeutic. It mm. was it was a it was a conversation and mm. uh, or a series of conversations. Mm. And I did learn stuff, mm. but mostly mm. I learned stuff not to do or mm. that I wasn't interested in. Mm. Mm. Um, but then um, I think with this question of um, d duration of therapy. Now we know what the research says. The re research says something along the lines of, and I haven't read this for a few years, but mm. the average people would come to me and say, how many sessions? And I would say, well, and if I look at the notes in my, the average among all my clients is three to six sessions. Some only stay for one. Mm -hmm. And also I offer a free session to start with, mm -hmm. not an hour, usually 20 minutes, but mm -hmm. because I'm, you know, I go on a bit, it can last 45 minutes, but that's my problem. But I, I offer a shorter mm -hmm. session mm -hmm. because I think it's only right that people should be able to check out the practitioner. I think any, any counselor or therapist who doesn't do that mm -hmm. should be corrected in my view. Mm -hmm. Um, because how do I know if I want to work with you till I've met you and how do I feel? And I recommend always, by the way, people should always check out three therapists before making a decision mm. because it can be quite intimidating. You need to go away and mm. um, so that's the starting point. And then I don't do what a lot of other therapists do. I don't time limit sessions because I think a conversation ends when it ends. It doesn't end because the clock says we've had 50 minutes, we've had an hour. Mm. So typically I go something over the hour, but I have had sessions as short as eight minutes oh, wow. uh, because I said to the client, well, what are we going to talk about today? About eight minutes. And he said, or oh, what do you want to do today? Something along those lines. And the guy said, he was a very analytic man, and in interestingly, both of his parents, he was a very mature lecturer, university lecturer, he had two very elderly parents who'd been, both been trained as analysts, psycho, uh, Freudian analysts. Oh, wow. Probably no connection, but he was a mess. Mm. And he was overweight, he had a heart condition, he'd already had a triple bypass, and he would receive no further treatment till he lost weight. And he couldn't find the motivation, but his life was, oh, you know, he had two mistresses and a wife. He, he was a, a very active man for his age. <laughs> and, but we had fabulous conversations. And I said to him, what? So what are we going to do today? He said, well, you've done it. I said, what do you mean I've done it? He said, well, that question you asked four minutes ago, or whatever it was, that has given me enough to work on oh, wow. for a week. Now, mm. I was immediately a bit suspicious, you know, and I said, because you know the Freudian concept of a, of a flight into what do they call it? You're running away from the therapy basically mm -hmm. <laughs> um, by saying everything's okay and you don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I've forgotten the terminology, but um, so I, I wound him up about that for about 20 minutes. I kept him there, but he was insistent that he was absolutely fine and he didn't, and he, got, he paid me the full price. And um, mm -hmm. so I thought, well, this is pretty good. I wonder if I can do this more often. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, yeah, and also I to compensate for the other conversations that last a little yeah, bit longer. Yes, well, well, it offsets. Yeah, yeah good thinking. So, um, so I don't limit time. Um, obviously, there has to be some scheduling, but I'm, I'm yeah. not. I've never been dependent. Hmm. Uh, in the same way that if somebody runs out of money, I've always said, "Don't let money be an obstacle." I will keep working with them until they're happy that they can leave and most people are very honest and in mm. fact that puts some people off because they don't want they say i feel too guilty mm. so of course mm. a good therapist i'll then say so tell me about your guilt <laughs> but seriously <laughs> yeah it does doesn't it um so so i don't limit the time and but the research shows that the the most benefit happens in the first few sessions mm. and then it yeah, kind of tails off I think it's a discipline for the therapist that I have to get results every session by mm. by results. I mean, the client has to feel leave feeling happier than when they walked into the room or feeling mm. they've had measurable change mm. or can apply something during the week. And I always check with them. I totally agree. So, 
I always say, so what's been useful in this session today? Now, it might sound a bit like fishing. And sometimes I have said, look, I'm not looking for compliments here, but you need to persuade me mm. that I've done my job mm. um, because nice. I have an ethical, you know, you're paying me money and I want to know we've had a result and that it's been useful. Nice. And likewise, if it's not, they have to tell me. Yeah, I love and it. And sometimes midway that has happened and people have said, well, um, you know, one man in, in family therapy with his wife, they wanted to divorce. Again, they were very elderly. They wanted to divorce. And um, they wanted to do it amicably. And that's why they came to see me. Hmm. Now, I'd just been to America to do a workshop with John Gottman, who wrote uh, Why Marriages Succeed or Fail. Hmm. And I loved his work. And perhaps I was a bit influenced by that. And about the second session, this guy said to me, um, I have a complaint or I have an observation or something. And I said, oh, yes, what's that? And he said, oh, by the way, I was doing couple and then individual, individual couple. And so second session was just him. And he said, I've, I've got a complaint. I wasn't very impressed because I think you have an agenda. I think you're trying to push us back to stay together. We want a divorce. That's clear. We both want a divorce. And I think you are trying to mend our marriage. And consciously, I wasn't, but he was probably right on the money because I, but I'm thinking these people are in their 70s. Mm. You know, uh, there, were, there was a history and I understood why and nobody had been unfaithful, but the wife simply wanted to have a different type of life. Mm. And he'd, he'd gone along with it. Mm. And so I agreed that probably unwittingly I had and I thanked him for that. Mm. And um, we focused more on how they were going to achieve, achieve an amicable divorce. Mm. Uh, it was pretty, pretty unnecessary in my view because they'd come along together to discuss it. So that was already a very good starting point. It's very amicable so, action. Yeah. But, yeah. So the question was, in solution-focused terms, this is this is a very big step you're taking. Statistically, we know that most people get pretty unpleasant with each other when they are separating, particularly mm. after a long life mm -hmm. together. How come you're able to collaborate like this? Yes, yeah. And that's all we have to do. We have to do more of that. Mm -hmm. And so that was our starting point. Oh, nice. Yeah. But I, I'm honest, if I'm honest, I think probably, yes, I did feel inside that mm -hmm. their best shot was to stay together. And I, mm -hmm. that had influenced my behavior. And he picked mm -hmm. up on that. Yeah. And uh, he corrected me. Yeah. And, and uh, um, respect for you that you could immediately say, hmm, you might be right and, and apologize. I, I think it's only human also as a therapist to, uh, to, to, to sometimes have this kind of uh, things. Yeah, that yeah. happens a lot with yeah. me. You yeah. know that I uh, often involuntarily four o'clock in the morning, the next morning, I, I'll be woken up uh, by something where I think I didn't maybe do my best or perhaps I missed something or something like that. And if I have that doubt, I will write to the client if oh, I think nice. it's appropriate. Yeah. It's funny. Um, I have the same experience. And why at four o'clock in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, it's damned annoying. I know that when I want yeah. to get a good night's sleep. Yeah. But I also know I, I, I probably, until I've dealt with it, mm. which means my laptop and write, write myself a note or work mm. something out, until mm. I've dealt with that, I won't get back to sleep. So. Oh, wow. Hmm. So, um, so that's what I people do. get mails from you at four o'clock in the night. <laughs> no, no, I never do that. Okay. I never do that. I no, think that would kidding. look pretty sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't do it to protect them. I do it to protect myself. And yeah. on on Gmail now, you can you can schedule it anyway. So yeah. I schedule it for the next day. Yeah. Um, but to come back to the thing about duration, because mm. I know that's what you asked me. Um, the idea is that um, every session has to count. Mm. And typically speaking, as I say, I see people three to five sessions. Mm. But it does happen, and I give them absolutely free reign. I usually say to people, look, the only kind of the, the wish I have, it's not exactly a stipulation, is that we have a session today and we have a session in a week. Mm. If you decide to come back, I mm. always give them that option. Maybe they don't want to. Mm. Thereafter, you decide. Mm. And the reason I do it in a week is because there's positive change in that week and I want to maximize that. I want you to notice it and I want to hear about it from you. Mm. Because if you leave it two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, you will have kind of adapted to those changes and they won't be so noticeable. That's mm. my belief. Mm. And, mm. and also I think um, it provides a better foundation for what follows mm. with people. 
Mm. Uh, but then, then you know, two weeks, quite a lot of people choose fortnightly. Money enters into it for some people, maybe too. Uh, and it tends to spread out after that up to about six sessions. Mm, yeah. Yeah, nice. Um, maybe a different uh, course, but the time is running. Uh, I, I'd love to talk about Frank Farrelly and um, uh, <laughs> the provocative coaching because I don't know a lot of people who who um, are very familiar uh, with the solution-focused approach, but also with the provocative uh, approach yeah. and work yeah. with Farrelly. When when we spoke before, you said people almost always laugh in the first session, even if yeah. they come in depressed. Yeah. And that's yeah. very interesting. Can you elaborate on that? Well, um, you know, I said that I don't follow the traditional rules. They come mm. into my house when mm. they used to mm. They oh. come into my house. And, mm. you know, the, the, we have a dog and there were children about when I started and and Milton Erickson used to do that. And I thought, when people come to this strange experience we call therapy, fine, I don't mind. I quite like the idea that it's strange because it gives me license to be strange. And I think that's quite important. Might come back to that. But it shouldn't be hostile. It shouldn't be friendly. I've heard stories you would not, well, perhaps you would, but about rules about turning up on time and uh if you don't turn up on time if you're five minutes late i won't see you you know some very rigid thinking yeah. um from from clients who've been to other therapists mm. and um so so i could anyway uh, i don't want to disrespect other therapists but there is some very rigid thinking in the field in some schools mm. of thought Mm. And I don't want to be like that. I want mm. I want people, whether they've been to therapy or not, I want them to come in and be surprised and think, mm. oh, this isn't like I thought it would, mm. would be. Mm. Um, so that's the first thing. And and in terms of humour, it just kind of comes out naturally. Mm. Um, I don't have to do anything. Mm. It's it's I, and I don't look for it. Mm. But if there's an opportunity, mm. uh, and and quite often it's provocative i mean for example somebody might say they'll come in with a lot of stuff and say well okay so as i understand it summary you've got this you got this you got this i'm interested in that last point oh yes yeah because that was you know i've been i've been drinking so much you know i've i just apart from the fact that i i feel terrible the next day my wife wants to leave me and so so would you say that drinking has been what a response to the situation or a strategy well, I suppose it's kind of a strategy, really. Okay, yeah. So, and how has that helped you? Mm. And the guy just started laughing and he yeah. said, well, <laughs> it hasn't. <laughs> and I can see that now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so are we going to continue talking about drinking or are we going to talk about how you'd like your life to be? Mm. And and then, you know. Mm. And, and also we would discuss the idea that drinking was an adaptive response to something else to kind of normalize it as far as possible and i don't mm. want guilt in the room and all of that stuff mm -hmm. about you've been doing it wrong and people people can generate that very well by themselves they don't need me to lay more of it on them yeah i love the anecdote you told before about the catholic woman do you remember <laughs> yes Did the lady who came came to see me yeah when i was again I, I was i was living in another town this was over 20 years i've been here 22 years now so it was before then and i felt you know sometimes people come into the room with you you've never met them might have spoken to them on the phone usually i had at that time and they would be um they they tell you their story and the the solution focused approach with me starts immediately that that even the telephone conversation is an opportunity for mm. something you know mm. so mm. so I'd, I'd be asking questions we'd be discussing this and her her difficulty i can't remember exactly what it was now but i do know that she uh, I, I think it was a chaotic life and things weren't working for her and she claimed to be depressed that's what she was saying she'd come to see me for but she didn't seem depressed but she seemed actually rigidly uh, adhering to her disciplines. She was sleeping well, you know, none of the seven points or what her diagnostic criteria were, were present. Mm -hmm. um, and after about the second, so during the second session, I just in frustration, really, of just listening to this endless whining, I suppose, really, and trying to frame it positively, but it, it wasn't, 
I couldn't get a I couldn't get a grasp on on anything, and it just I heard myself say, you, you uh, because she was very uh, her religion was very important to her, and she was a Catholic, and I'm not, but my wife was at that time, um, wife who sadly died some years ago, mm. and so my children were raised in that tradition, and um, uh, so I knew a little bit about it, and I said, you know, you claim you're a Catholic, and you very proud of your perfectionism and the way you adhere to your discipline and your doctrines. So why, why are you not doing depression properly? And she sort of looked at me and she said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, I've worked with a lot of depressed people. I had suffered from depression myself two periods in my life, and I know what it feels like. And I can't get a feel for how depression is affecting you. You tell me all these things, you're attributing it to depression. But I think it's a bit nebulous, it's a bit hard to grasp. So would you agree to a little task to help cl clarify things? Mm. She said, what is it? I said, I'm not going to tell you that until you agree. Again, sort of, I don't know, is it an Ericksonian tradition? I can't remember, but get people to commit to the task before. Um, if you trust me, will you do this task? And she said, yes, yes, okay, then. And I said, well, I'd like you to go home. Now you've explained how you get up, you get your daughter to school, I know it's always a rush. And then you go home, you clear the breakfast table, and then you get on with your day. And as I remember, she belonged to a choir, and she did lots of activities like that. So I said, if you, when you get home, and you've cleared the table, and you've got the house in order, I'd like you to take 10 minutes, just sit at the table and just get properly depressed. Paradoxical intervention. Mm -hmm. And I guess both of our mouths fell open a bit because I thought, what have I done? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was a very strong instinctive kind mm -hmm. of response that I had. And I, 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 she said, I can't believe you said that. I said, neither can I. <laughs> and we were both laughing by this time. So. And a couple of times later, she said, honestly, shake your head. Honestly, I came over here. I can't believe you said that. I said, yeah, but you agreed to do it. And I, I thank you for your trust in me because there is method in this. Mm -hmm. So will you please do it? She mm -hmm. came back the next week. She said, you were right. I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So I said, what are we going to talk about? And then we had a conversation about other things and mm -hmm. the stuff that was troubling her. Very nice. I think Milton Erickson would... Uh... <laughs> Be proud yeah, of but I, I, I was I was chastising myself for quite a long time after that. It was, she took it extremely well, and so that yeah. was that reassured me. But I'm 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 a bit uh, uh, curious because there is a method behind it. You 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 knew that, and still you were chastising yourself. Why? Yes, yes, because I think this idea, particularly, remember, we're talking probably 25 years ago. Okay. The idea of what therapy is and isn't, mm, yeah. you know, in all, I didn't have the sort of training where I was uh, slavishly tied to a single counselling model, but mm. I knew about all of the mm -hmm. yeah. the, the sort of conventions of counselling. You know, mm. some counsellors even had a separate entrance and exit point, and you never share anything about your mm. life. Mm. I flew in the face of all that. I always have done because I think people need first and foremost to meet a human being. Yeah. I talk about my own experiences because yeah. if you've lost somebody you love, or if you've been rejected, or if a uh, project your honours failed or you've been made redundant, you know, I've had all of those experiences. So mm. why wouldn't you show bringing up children, particularly with parents, mm. yeah. it, it's reassuring to know that, of course, I don't know what their experience is, but people like to know that we have some common ground here. Yeah, I think that works a lot better than the, the Freudian therapist who is a blank slate or what did <clears> you say, a blank face and shows no emotion at all. Yeah. It is my belief. And and mm -hmm. before, I don't want anybody going away thinking I've got a down on Freudian therapy because I read, mm -hmm. I mean, if you if you look at Ellen Berger's book, which is The History of the Unconscious, I mean, it's mm -hmm. about that thick. Mm -hmm. A Swiss uh, man wrote that. It's a, the most fabulous book. And I have a mm -hmm. lot of respect for those mm -hmm. people on whose shoulders we're standing. Yeah, I agree um, also. But everything also, evolves. The, the psychodynamic therapy has also a lot of offspring and a development that are alive today 
that mm. are really evolved, right? I'm, mm. I'm, for example, I'm reading now about uh, functional analytic psychotherapy. Yes. Uh, which is almost like acceptance and commitment therapy, but very much in the relationship with the, the client. And it has psychoanalytic roots, I think, but it's also very in the here and now and connecting and warm and apathetic. Mm. It's, it's a nice, it's almost a crossover between Freudian and, and behavior uh, yeah. science. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I things think, changed. Uh, yes, things are evolving all the time, mm, uh, of yeah. course. And, Luckily. and I, as I've got older, I do, and, and particularly I've been working in, uh, with. I've worked with trauma quite a lot. Mm. And now we have trauma-informed care, and I've been doing training on that with people within that solution-focused therapy because it, mm. it matches very closely the criteria for trauma-informed care. So if you are a solution-focused practitioner, you are trauma-informed mm. because, of course, you're thinking about the whole person and you're mm. wondering how they came to be who they are today and what happened to them rather than uh, analysing the problems and all those things. Mm. Um, so I've... I have great respect for for those people who laid the foundations, yeah. and I have to say I I probably use more of it now than I ever did mm. uh, because it's unavoidable. Mm. Yeah, good to mention that uh, as well. Yeah. Mm. So uh, another top topic uh, that I'd like to explore is that you work online a lot, and mm -hmm. uh, you did that way before the the pandemic. I mean, nowadays, everybody yeah. uses Zoom in, in coaching and, and, and yeah. training, but you did way before. Can you share a bit about your best, uh, yeah, uh, your foundings and, and your, your maybe you have some tips how to do it effectively? Well, I I did start using it sporadic occasionally a long time ago. Oh. Um, and at the time, I was head of clinical practice, I think that was the title for an EAP provider, you know, an employee assistance provider. Mm -hmm. And there was telephone counselling. I think that a charity in the UK, it might have been Mind, started to use, oh, it was Relate, the, yeah, Relate started to use telephone counselling. Mm -hmm. And there was resistance to it, mm -hmm. as you'd expect. Mm -hmm. But their research showed that actually they were, they were accessing people who otherwise wouldn't come Mm. particularly young men and younger men okay. because you can go into your back bedroom and call yeah. a counselor yeah. Yeah. without having to explain it to your family mm. or anybody else for that matter yeah. Yeah. and then you've got it it's you haven't got travel you haven't got parking you haven't got all those things and it's easier yeah. to fit in people's lives so it just made sense to me so i would yeah. do telephone conversations with people initially and then skype conversations mm. I would always try and meet them. Mm. And I traveled a lot around the UK at that time. So sometimes I would see people. I remember I met one man on a park bench. Uh, we, we made an appointment to meet in the park and have our first mm. conversation. Oh, yeah. um, and then having met him, I felt it would be okay to continue with uh, the phone, I think it was at that time. Mm. So when the pandemic came, it wasn't alien to me. No. But I'd always seen it as um, not, not a method of choice. Mm. but I was forced to work that way yeah. and I actually don't find a difference there are one or two things that I shy away from so for example I'm working with somebody at the moment who had a traumatic childhood for the most surprising reasons um, he's a young man and I would really rather see him personally and we will do to, to tackle that aspect at some point we've agreed to do that but um, every couple of weeks we speak and we have, we're now on our fifth or sixth session. Um, and it took a long time to get to what he wanted to change. Mm. Um, and so now finally we're making, uh, some, some real progress. Mm. So, um, I, I like working this way because it's obviously easier for me, mm. um, and also because it's virtually automated in terms of people booking themselves in. They just go to my online cal calendar and I, they get a Zoom link, I get a Zoom link, I get an email and I pitch up on uh, at the right time and time of day and the right, you know. So, so I think it works well. Yeah. Um, 
however you know i'm it's still part of what i do is to see people in my home because i don't have an office anymore and uh and that works well too yeah yeah i can imagine and what i'm wondering uh recently i coached an, uh, a man from the united states he was living in holland but he was from the states and although he know dutch culture he's still american and i thought beforehand the culture difference isn't that big but still some things and he had an yeah. issue uh, around uh, women and dating uh, etc some things he had to, to explain to me how things mm. are different in the united states so i'm wondering if you were you were coaching someone in a, a, a country that's even more different uh, in culture how do you deal with it because in one second you're talking to someone in the other side of the world how well do you, yeah how do you with that? absolutely i quite often speak to people in india for yeah. various reasons i have mm -hmm. i have uh, coaches in india and also the far east mm -hmm. and um um yeah it's easy to make the assumption that because we share a language mm -hmm. um we are uh we share ideas in the same way and they mean the same things to us mm -hmm. and i have to constantly remind myself of that mm -hmm. and of course the more i work with the culture in particular india mm -hmm. the more i'm seeing some common themes for mm -hmm. example they've been predominantly younger people Hmm. Uh, but the structure, the social structures there and the family structures do not make these easy conversations to have hmm. initially. And and those are very often the source of the problem in a, in a fast developing country. Um, ideas about marriage, ideas about uh, gender mm -hmm. uh, can can produce real strife for the within the family if they're spoken about at all. And very often they're not. Hmm. So I, I have to constantly remind myself that I don't know what local resources are. Mm. I don't know anything about attitudes beyond what I'm being presented with mm. on screen. Mm. Uh, but I usually I give voice to that. You know, mm. I, I do say to people, look, um, I, was, I was talking to a young woman um, during lockdown, actually. Mm. And I just felt the elephant in the room was that she was 20 something bright, enthusiastic, uh graduate a uh, university graduate and um here was i this old bloke in england and i said to her look you you know how can we talk together what do you think do you think because she didn't choose me this came through mm. a system which meant mm. that i was her coach mm. for for a work related matter but it turned out not to be work related as they so often do and um so uh, and she said no, that's absolutely fine. But, mm. you know, so we acknowledged it and we talked about the difference. And I've quite often had to do that. For example, um, working with somebody from a from a Muslim culture, mm. uh, as I did uh, years and years ago when I was actually doing live work, consultancy work, and I was in um, a Southern Republic of um, what was then the USSR for some time. Mm. And I had to really be coached by a Muslim colleague in, in the sort of some of the things that I needed to deal with. Mm. So I think we have to acknowledge the difference and recognize possibly our shortcomings and not jump to conclusions mm. or make assumptions. Mm. Even even assumptions about how people res will respond post conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, in the UK, I know that people will go away and think about it. And that it, I haven't, I hope I haven't left them feeling intimidated or mm. Mm. but is that always the case? Mm. So I think the safest way is what we say in conflict resolution, which is to surface assumptions, not just to assume, mm. is to talk about where we're both starting from. Mm. Mm. Not always, but mm -hmm. quite often. Yeah. yeah, I've done that. Yeah, uh, great perspective and uh, very uh, careful. Uh, if you, yeah. yeah, and also, yeah. of course, if you're asking the question, if, if one is asking, if one is acknowledging that difference, that's already a big step. Yeah. But for a solution focused practitioner in particular, you know, I have this mm. phrase that goes through my head taken from a British TV series where the the, the Spanish uh, waiter in this faulty towers for the people. Oh, who, John Cleese. Know, yeah. yeah, yeah. Manuel would say, I, uh, I know nothing oh. with his Spanish accent. And that is really something I carry with me all oh, the time wow. to remind myself. 
yeah. I don't know anything. Yeah. And it's liberating, you know, it's it liberating. It's why I think solution focused practitioners don't burn out because we don't know anything. We're just yeah. listening and putting some stuff together. I love it. It's it's uh, it's also it's got a, a Zen kind of flavor, yeah. the, the the beginner's mind, you know, yeah, so absolutely. fresh. And and yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's nice you bring it up in, in the intercultural uh, sphere, because exactly there we can use the beginner's mind and the not knowing stance. So uh, it's so useful. But do you think I mean, we we, you know, we have similar kind of outlook about this whole field coaching mm -hmm. and therapy and mm -hmm. does it take a certain type of person to be brave enough to say that you mean to to stay in the not to admit stance? to accept that we know nothing oh i think so to be honest and i think uh, if you really want to to develop this in yourself uh, when it doesn't come easy it might be possible, but it, you need some uh, experience, uh, or I mean, you need some time to 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 understand why why it's so special, and and also uh, be be prepared to to let loose your control. Your, your yeah, if you yeah, want to. that's a big yes. And if, if you're I very noticed... attached to the role of expert, yeah, then it's hard. Absolutely. Absolutely. You agree? And, yeah. and of course, we're it's 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 woven into our cultures, isn't it? professionalism, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, yeah. and um, I think one of the reasons that uh, we're like that is because we're taught. I mean, after all, people spend a lot of money on training, they get that yeah. Yeah. certificate or diploma on the wall, whatever it is. Yeah. How can you say at the end of it that you know nothing? But I, yeah. I'm, I, is it not true that the more we know, the less we know? Oh, yeah. And yeah. sometimes the safest place to go is I don't know anything. I'm giving up. Look, look, I'll just see. Mm, and yeah. and of course, solution focused therapy tells us if it's not working, go back to the beginning. Mm. Start with first principles. Yeah. You know, define a goal. Find out if you've missed something. And I think you know. I I ask that question because I've had students when I was teaching um, regular students. I was teaching conflict resolution at, at university and uh, in London and. I was obviously very, uh, one might say, lightly obsessed with the solution focused model. And actually, the reason I trained as a mediator was because and the reason I did my masters in conflict resolution was because when I looked at the, the syllabus of the course, and then saw the reading list, I thought I've read most of these people, there's mm. so much of the mediation and conflict resolution field, because it's systemic, mm. is is couched in uh people like virginia satir and erickson and mm. uh, but also their their inheritors so there was a lot of um common ground for me so mm. it's kind of leaning the system it's very systemic anyway mm. and it, it's leaning that way so it was it was comfortable for me but i i i would say that half the people on a two-year course that i was teaching never got that idea they mm. just couldn't let go of more traditional ways of thinking about problems mm. and of course if you're if you're a, a conflict resolver you've got to go into the room with an idea that this has to go somewhere quickly mm. yeah you know so if you if you spend your time looking for causes then it won't go very far no i agree so we're going to wrap up it is there a question, uh, Barry, that I should have asked, but didn't? Oh, wow, I've had a couple as we were going through, I think the first thing, uh, maybe about internalizing the solution focus model, hmm. because it's very formulaic when you read the books. Hmm. And I've always said to students, read the book, then throw it away and do your own thing. You know, it's only when when I knew we were having this conversation, I thought, God, I hope, I hope I'm not asked about the the key points of a solution focused approach because mm. because i've internalized them i do them mm. yeah what i do mostly is normalizing reframing exceptions and scaling mm. those are probably mm. the things i occasionally use the miracle question mm. but i haven't got the formula anymore it's just mm. all internalized so i would say to people nature. you know practice one thing at a time and mm. and build it up from there mm. so the question i i could have been asked i suppose is you know how does it develop over to say that if i was a, 
if I was a purist, mm -hmm. you could watch my sessions. Well, you've seen one of my sessions on the training course. Yeah, so, I did. Yeah. you know, does it stand out as being obviously solution focused? You know, you might work it out, but I'm not doing a formula. Mm -hmm. I'm having a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and uh, a very good one, a uh, very nice one, I think. And I love what you just said. I said, I, I'm just doing normalizing, reframing. Uh, scaling, scaling except well probably normalizing and reframing first of all to put people at their ease yeah i'm looking for except i'm listening for exception yeah. from the first contact mm. um and you know because i'm going to summarize that back and i'm mm. going to use that mm. i'm i'm asking about strengths i'm asking about the resources for for safety reasons i want mm. to know about family friends support they've got out there in the community mm. um and uh and scaling a lot of scaling because mm. unless we what i say about scaling is it teaches people to think incrementally mm. you know it's not oh i'm depressed or i'm not depressed mm. or i'm having a panic attacks or i'm not having a panic attacks mm. if you can't think in increments then you mm. can't spot when you're having a few less panic attacks exactly. you're just reporting on the panic attacks yeah. and so forth yeah to explore so, all the, the the shades of gray instead of only black and white exactly yeah nice exactly yeah so yeah. well uh, um i can really recommend your uh, online course on udemy i think if people look on udemy uh for uh barry wimble they'll find if they do, do yeah you to me barry Wimbolt, and yeah i've got a few courses on there and uh um, but only one on solution focused. And I've often mm. thought about doing a follow up, but I just mm. haven't got around to it mm. because it's a topic I love and a topic which mm. I think can be the answer to a lot of a lot of difficulties in the mental health field at the moment. Yeah, so, oh, I think so. You know, in yeah, terms of accessibility. Yeah. And the waiting lists yeah. and, and, and stuff so, like that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so um, uh, your website yeah. is? W, well, www dot obviously Barry Winbolt, that's with an N in Winbolt dot com. Oh, okay. um, for a couple of days, you might get some weird. It's being updated at the moment, but the, they both work. But the new one hasn't been launched yet. But I was on the web this morning looking for something else mm -hmm. and uh, it came up and I didn't know it was public yet. So <laughs> anyway, and, uh, you know, obviously you can you can email me or contact me through those things. And I'm on LinkedIn, as you know, and uh so if, i'm always happy to talk i love love talking about this subject so Great. thank you very much for the opportunity thank it's you been very enjoyable yeah for um, me as well uh, thanks a lot for yeah. all your stories wisdom and uh, sh uh sharing well, so, thank uh, you for your flattery and anytime you know right. i don't need encouraging to talk about myself like that so thanks a lot yeah you too so bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.